comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. We'll begin reading in the 23rd verse. If you're reading in your Bible, that's, that's the passage we'll be turning to. And if you'd like to use the Pew Bible, it's found on page 20 in the New Testament. And so we invite you to read along. May we stand now for the reading of the Gospel. Jesus is speaking and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It's, it is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. You blind guides. You strain out, the, they strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the plate, so the outside also may become clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside are full of bones, the bones of the dead, and all kind of uncleanness. This morning, as we have heard the word of God, let us affirm our faith in God through the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Today we're starting a sermon series that we're calling Unfiltered. Years ago, when you would see a picture of a Hollywood actor or actress, no matter how long they had been on the screen, either TV or movie, you would see that picture and you would notice that, well, you were sort of in awe of them in awe of their skin, which was free of any blemish, and there wasn't a single wrinkle. Their teeth were always whiter than snow. It was amazing. Then, at some point, you would see them being interviewed live. And in that moment, they looked like an older, less attractive relative. <laughs> Something had happened. You see, that's when we all learned a little bit of the way Hollywood worked for the right amount of money, a skilled photographer could airbrush any picture and they could make years go away and all the effects of time disappear and suddenly they were just like they were when you first saw them on the screen. Well, nowadays, through the advances in technology, anyone with a smart device can do the same thing to your pictures. Through apps and filters, suddenly the laugh lines are gone, crow's feet disappear, years just seem to float away. I remember as a child watching reruns of the old Doris Day show and, and always noticing that when they did close-ups of Doris Day, it always seemed blurry. Well, I didn't know why. 
Until years later when I was reading an article about her and, and her philanthropy in the world and all the money she'd raised for different causes, it also talked about how when she was on television or in the movie, if there was a close-up, she it was in her contract that they would film her using soft focus, a little blurry, because she didn't like to wear a lot of makeup, and she said her face was covered in freckles, and she didn't want the world to see her freckles. Well, now, again, if you have a smartphone, all your pictures could be in soft focus, and whatever you don't want the world to see suddenly can disappear. Recently, some of our team here at the church worked on some pictures of me and using filters. You start off with this picture. I think it looks great, personally. But then they went nostalgic. What about the black and white version? Isn't that good? But how about if we just stepped it up a little bit? Maybe this look. <laughs> and then for everybody watching Disney Plus and The Mandalorian, we could go to this level. I mean... I, I, I like that one too. Star Wars fan, I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of that one. But you can do this with any phone, with any picture. This past week, school started back. Saw on Facebook and Instagram lots of pictures of that first day of school photo opportunity for parents and kids. But if you're like us, when Michelle and I had our kids at home, how many times do you post the first picture taken? Very seldom, because you're trying to get everyone to look the right way, everyone to smile. If you have older kids in the mix, how many threats does it take nowadays to get a smile out of the older kids? And if they're of a certain age, do they demand that you show them the picture first before they allow you to post it anywhere so that then they can adapt it, fix it, and filter it before it goes out? I mean, don't we all wish that our lives were actually as amazing as they can sometime appear on social media. I mean, if we aren't careful, our filtered life isn't confined to back school pictures. It extends to all of life, especially life on social media. It suddenly becomes this very carefully crafted existence that isn't real. They call it image crafting. Image crafting. It's not just about filtering only the good news through, but it's about building a carefully constructed image that isn't real. It looks good. It's why we do it. It feels good at the time to project this above average version of ourselves and our family, our life, our adventures out into the world. We get admiration, we get praise, we get the envy of everyone in our social media network when they see the wonderful and cool places we go to and all the awesome things that we do, we feel validated. Our sense of self-worth and self-esteem safe for yet another day. But the problem is that even though it feels good in the moment, over the long term, filtering and image crafting hurts. It's not a new problem. Around 30 AD, Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem. It's the last week of his ministry. He, he's already ridden into the city, palm branches waving on Palm Sunday. He's only hours away from the Last Supper and the crucifixion. And so time is critical. There's not time for lengthy parables that maybe they'll get, maybe they won't. It, it, there's not time for that. He has to be very direct. He has to be very clear. Time doesn't allow him the opportunity to hold back and, and to clarify later. And so he speaks and says things that are hard to hear. He speaks to the Pharisees and he calls the Pharisees and the scribes hypocrites. He says that they only clean the outside of their cups and plates and inside it's all still dirty. The pretty outside is, is filled with greed and self-indulgence. He said that they should start on the inside and work their way out. He tells them that their whitewashed tombs, painted up graves, 
beautiful on the outside, but all full of bones and yuck on the inside. This criticism, when he, when he, what we read today, that's just continuing what he said at the beginning of this chapter. He's talking to the Pharisees again, and he says, They do all of their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and, and they love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogue, and they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. The Pharisees were all about image, not about substance. I, I know that, that we care about what others think. We're supposed to be in community with other people and, and there's social norms that we're supposed to follow. And that's appropriate. But the issue is, the issue is what happens when approval and popularity begin to push out everything else. When image is all we care about, substance isn't there. What happens when, what would happen if what everyone thinks of us isn't that important anymore? We already are dealing with what happens when so many in our world, what everyone thinks of them drives everything they do. So what would happen if we were the opposite? The Pharisees looked like they were living the absolute perfect life. When people looked at them, they, they didn't think they could ever keep up. They didn't think they could ever catch up with the Pharisees. But Jesus says the Pharisees might look good on the outside, but on the inside, they need a lot of work. When we go on social media and our friends' social media accounts are full of perfect date nights and perfect workouts and perfect kids and perfect vacations and perfect everything, it makes it really hard to think that our imperfect life is good enough. Comparison is the thief of joy. And constantly comparing ourselves against a carefully crafted ideal is surefire recipe for jealousy and disappointment and malcontent with our, with our own life, which probably before we logged on, <laughs> we thought our life was going okay. That our vacation was good. That, that the place we rented was nice. That that our kids were above average. And then we log in and we just stare. Nobody's life is perfect. But when we start thinking, if we don't project the perfect image, then we won't fit in with all the supposedly perfect people around us. That's when the trouble comes. Not long ago, I read an article that said people should start asking if their online presence is merely an image or does it contain any substance. And they said the two questions people should ask are, if someone in my social network were to meet me in person today, would today's post that I have made actually match up to my real life? And... The other is, do I feel like I'm an, I'm, I'm, do I feel like an imposter in my own life? Afraid that people will discover that I'm not nearly as perfect as I post. That on the other side of the room, from that idyllic Christmas tree, perfectly framed in the center of my window, with all the presents around it, and everything is just like it came off of a Christmas card ideal on the other side of the room beyond that picture is a sea of boxes wrapping paper tissue paper broken ornaments tree needles mess and at least one screaming child but we didn't post that we just post the idyllic the picture of the family at the lake the picture of the family at the lake took 19 tries and eventually, you had to be okay that the sulking kid would not be in the picture at all. 
just let them go and everyone else smile. What if we did away, or what if we limited at least our need for this approval? Our sense of, our sense of desire for the right image, or worrying about what the neighbors think. We're trying to portray ourselves as perfect. What if we quit worrying about that? Jesus is saying that the Pharisees, the problem with the Pharisees is they're all, all that they're worried about is what people think. Not if there's anything real to who they are. So if we step away from that, what do we do? How do we, how do we deal with this in our life? We've got to do things that feed us on the inside because isn't that what Jesus is talking about? That the inside and the outside aren't matching up? So how do we feed ourselves on the inside so that we don't hunger and thirst for people to tell us that we're awesome all the time? How do we deal with that? Well, we have to feed our soul. We have to, as Jesus would talk about, clean the inside of the cup. And how we do that, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it's not new, nor is it fancy. This is not earth-shattering information new to the world of the church. Here's how we do it. Here's how we feed our soul. First, we pray. I told you, this is not new. We pray. We pray every day. Because, you see, praying and staying in constant communication with God is critical Because God is the one who loves you unconditionally and who tells you that he loves you regardless of what others think. And then the other one, the other other thing we need to do to, to help feed our soul is we need to read Scripture. You know, like someone said, scripture, the scriptures are a love letter from God to you telling you that you were created at the top of creation. That you are made in God's own image. That you are incredibly special. And that you are God's beloved. Feed your heart with that. Feed your heart with that. When we're doing those two things, we are cleaning the inside. We're caring for our soul. And we're becoming more and more like the person that Jesus calls us to be. Because we're, we're focused on what Jesus thinks and not others. I love the story that's attributed to Michelangelo. It's said that Michelangelo, as a sculptor, uh, well, if he was sculpting an angel, his process would be to take a block of marble and to look at the marble and envision an angel in that block of marble. And then he would simply chip away everything that didn't look like an angel makes perfect sense. Well, through prayer and scripture, through working on our soul, through dealing with the inside, what if we could chip away everything in our life that didn't look like Jesus? That didn't look like being a faithful disciple? Later, if you keep reading in scripture and you go over into the the letters that are found in the New Testament, You get to Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And Paul deals with this kind of thing in his letter as well. Paul talks about the fact that in order for us to be the person we need to be, it's not about what's outside, it's about what's inside. And Paul says that we need to put down roots deep into the things of God, prayer and scripture, so that our souls are nourished by those Again, it's it's what's on the inside, not focus on what's on the outside. Focus on substance, not on image. What Paul says to the church in Ephesus in chapter 3, verse 16, he says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you, that you may be strengthened in your inner being with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted in and grounded in love. I mean, Paul is saying that we should put our roots down into God's love and let that give us sustenance. 
And he continues, he said, I pray that that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When we put our roots down deep into God, when we the thing, down deep into the things of God, when we tend to the inside, when we care for our soul, that's more important than this image. Jesus critiqued the Pharisees and he said, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. The Pharisees aren't doing anything of substance, he says. It's all about show. What would it be like if we pull back our concern over what others think and we begin to focus instead on what can we actually do to tend to our soul and then to make a difference in the lives of others, to make a difference in God's kingdom? If we can lessen our desire for the approval of people that sometimes we only connect with on social media or or we're trying to impress the stranger who drives down our street. If we can stop being like the Pharisees and, and worrying about simply presenting the right image, then we will have time to fill our lives with substance. Time to actually do the things that matter. Time to pray. Time to study scripture. Time to spend with God. Time to tend our soul. In the gospel reading, the Pharisees spent a lot of their time and effort trying to look like the perfect follower of their faith. They looked like they kept the law better than anyone else. They looked the part. But the inside didn't match the outside. Being a follower of Jesus means that we must feed our souls. We have to clean the inside. We have to spend time with God. We have to spend time in prayer and in scripture. We have to spend time doing the things that feed us, that put our roots down deep into the things of God, that nourish us so that we don't just settle for looking like a disciple of Jesus. Instead, we live lives of substance where we tend our soul and where we make a difference in our world for Christ. Where we show the world around us that at times we don't have it all together. But we are still striving to live our life for Christ. And we know, and we know that it's more important to please God than to please people who will click a like button. So today, is your life life unfiltered? Online, in person, is it unfiltered? Are you living the life that God calls you to live? Focused on the things that actually matter? Or are you like the Pharisees? Still whitewashing, still pretending still filtering. The unfiltered life allows us the time to spend really, really looking inside to see where God needs to change us, to see where God may be working, to pray, to study scripture, to make a difference. But you have to decide if you're willing to give up that image in order to be real. And today is the day that you can start to make that change. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision, number 49 in your hymnal. And we're going to sing verses 1 through 3, and then verse 4 is our benediction response. I invite you now to stand and join together as we sing. Thank you.